G'day guys, welcome to the Process of Success podcast. I'm here with Chris Tremaine, fast bowler for Victoria and Australia. Um, Chris was the Sheffield Shield Player of the Year this year, just finished, voted by the umpires, had a phenomenal season with 51 wickets um, and an average of 21 and a best bowling of 7 for 82. Trem, thanks very much for joining us. No, thanks for having me. For those of you who might not have heard of Chris or, or don't know much about him, he's played four ODIs for Australia, 44 first class matches, 170 uh, first class wickets, um, one first class 100, 21 list day matches and 32 T20 matches. So a very experienced player and, and someone no doubt we'll all learn a bit from. Um, to start with, I'd like to take our guests back to the, the very start. And, and what, did, what did your childhood look, look like? Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in a, a tiny little town, like a little village um, of about 400 people uh, called Yeovil. Uh, it's sort of been like this little Bermuda Triangle of, of central New South Wales, which is sort of uh, Dubbo, Orange, um, and not much out west, but sort of in the middle of those two um, that uh, no one... Well, it's it's funny. Every you can go all around the world, you'll you'll seem to find someone who knows someone from Yeovil, but um, you know someone from Dubbo might not know where it is. So right. it's it's sort of a it's an interesting one. But yeah, grew up there. My mum was a teacher there. Um, my dad worked in Wellington, and and um, yeah, spent all my time on the property um, in between there and and uh, Yeovil. Awesome. Yeah. And so, what's your earliest memory of playing cricket? Um, I, pl I remember playing, we used to have a, a competition, a sort of an under 12s, under 13s, um, Friday afternoon competition. We'd play against the sort of the other little villages around that um, area. Um, in my, my first ever game, I recall uh, the local doctor um, was down there watching and, and he said, uh, he tapped on the top of the uh, the fence and he said, if you hit it over this on the full, you get six runs. And, and I thought, that's that's awesome. And then I remember walking out to the ground and I was I would have only been six years old and it felt like it took forever. And I remember looking back and I could barely see mum. I could barely see the doctor that was sitting with mum and, and thinking there's no way I'm ever going to be able to hit this ball over that fence. So um, that's um, it's a blurry memory, but, you know, that's 20 years ago now. So that was... Um, that was my very first. Uh, I remember getting out a couple of times and, and I was actually batting with... Um, one of the, uh, I think she must have been in year seven, a, a girl that was quite a quite a very good cricketer at the time. So, um, uh, and that was probably the last I ever saw of her. But um, yeah, I was my first ever innings was with a with a female cricketer who was who was streaks better than I was. So, nice. Yeah. And then how did it progress from there? Um, it was a funny one. I, I, I played a little bit of that Friday afternoon stuff, and um, uh, I think maybe four or five years later, uh, I tried out for. What, what was the PWSA um, sort of Western Zone region, um, and fluked it. I got picked for this for this Western Zone team to play against the other regions and, and Sydney teams, and um, I batted at probably 11 and bowled third or fourth change, and and wasn't overly um, uh, compelling. But uh, we had, fortunately for for us, you know, Yeovil being such a small place, we had. Uh, a bloke called Damien Tui, who was convener of school sports uh, for New South Wales, or, and it had a lot to do with uh, School Sports Australia. Um, and I think from that, you know, from the moment I got picked um, in that first year, I had another year in it. The next year, um, we would go down to the nets uh, before school, lunchtime, after school, whenever it was available, and, and we'd do little drills and we'd hit drop drills or inverarity drills um, over and over again. We'd practice batting, we'd practice bowling. We um, even even before that, we, you know, you'd walk around school and and if Damo was on duty, um, he'd have a tennis racket and a tennis ball, and he'd find me in the in the park somewhere and hit a tennis ball at me until I dropped him. So. Um, you know, there, Damo was always there, sort of growing up through that little period. And I went from probably that year to the second year I played. I went batting at three to opening the bowling in, I guess, 12 months of, of little handy hand-eye coordination drills. Yeah, and yeah. so is he something that my business is called Cricket Mentoring? Is he still someone you're in contact with? Is he still a mentor of yours? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was a there was a brief sort of period when I finished uh, school. I had a shoulder reconstruction. There was a couple of maybe 12 to 18 months where I didn't do anything. Um, I was injured, I couldn't work, I, I was a shocking student so I couldn't go to uni either. Um, so I basically was was a paperweight for, for that amount of time and, and there was a little bit of a lull there with Damo because I was outside of cricket and, and I probably should have used his ex 
expertise a little bit more during that time. But when we eventually got um, got started again and then got picked to play for New South Wales, he said to me that, um, you know, that you've got these coaches and these players around you, you probably don't need my help anymore. And so that was a, that was a little bit annoying because he'd got me to that point and there's still things that I'd rather talk to him about um, than anyone else. And Damo um, uh, might not be able to help me with my cover drive, but he'll help me get out of bed when it's really tough or he'll help me um, understand that, you know, I've had a bad day or, or a shocking um, set or I, I just can't can't quite wrap my head around something and he's such a neutral point of contact that he can he can surmise this whole situation and, and give me a give me a good resolution to to get through it I guess yeah so you, you still speak to him now after yeah, day yeah. in day out yeah and do you have other mentors you go to now as well um a little bit yeah I've, I've got uh I, I had a I've got a manager um who started helping me out a little bit when uh, I first started playing for New South Wales and I'd ne actually never met him. I'd um, been told about him through uh, mutual friends at, at club cricket in Sydney and um, got to chatting. He said he'd help me out um, and then eventually uh, progressed, went to Canberra a couple of times to meet up with him um, and a relationship sort of blossomed there and, and, um, and he, he helps quite significantly with um, uh, mentality and, and uh, he, he's given me great um, nuggets of advice. I mean, we talked about perspective not long ago and, and he said, you know, if, if someone perceives you to be one way, you may as well be that way. If someone perceives you to be lazy or, um, or, or um, weak or if someone perceives you to be not quite there, you may as well be not quite there because that's what, um, that's what they've perceived you to be and, and, you know, there's only one way to, to change that perception. So. Um, even if you don't believe it, and even if other people don't believe it, um, there's there's that there's those people, and especially those important people, your coaches, um, selectors, those sort of people. If that's their perception, then you need to change that's that reality, perception. Yeah. yeah, that's it. That's that is the reality. So yeah. yeah, awesome. And now going back to your your sort of teenage years, you were playing school cricket. Were you playing club cricket as well? And how often were you training? I suppose. Um, we so when I was in still in Yeovil, I was at Yeovil until I was in year ten. Um, I played Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon in Wellington um, and we'd train, we sort of play Friday afternoon for Yeovil, we'd duck into Wellington, play in the morning, then you'd play in the afternoon. You didn't really have to train that often because you're playing three games over two days. Um, and then when we sort of progressed and I went to Dubbo to play grade cricket, uh, we'd try and get into Dubbo, which was about an hour drive, um, two hours each, each way I guess. Um, and um, you'd get in there maybe once or twice a week, twice if you were really lucky, if mum had to do some shopping or something like that. So um, we train um, pretty hard those those one or two nights. Um, I reckon I only played probably half a season there before mum got sick of me and shipped me off to boarding school, um, in which you, you pretty much trained every day. You played with your mates and you had two sort of set, uh, set training schedules from Tuesday on Thursday, but um, you're always in the nets or you're always hitting balls or throwing balls or doing something, so, yeah. Awesome, Dubbo's a, a good hub for cricketers. I've got a couple of good mates, Rootsy and Timmy Armstrong from yeah. Dubbo. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've not, I've actually missed both of those blokes. Timmy's obviously in England now, and and um, Lord only knows where Rootsy is. I'm not sure where Rootsy is, so yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I've played a, a lot with Tim growing up, and he was he was um, phenomenal. He was just a, that, that talent that could do anything, uh, bowled the fastest and hit the ball the hardest. Um, and Rootsy was uh, was always a, a diamond in the rough, wasn't he? So yeah. he, he was great, um, and re uh, quite a really uh, good off spinner. Yeah. So, um, and I actually enjoyed seeing him succeed at what he did because he was it's almost like the underdog that mm. just sort of popped up and did well, and yeah. and, and I enjoyed his success. Awesome. Yeah. Now, what point did you? What were your goals as a teenager? Were you thinking I want to play cricket for Australia? Was that something you, th you thought of at that sort of age? Um, it's it's well, it's still my goal now. Um, was that I just wanted to be a professional um, and I was really lucky. Uh, I always had that belief that I was going to be a professional cricketer. Um, only in hindsight now am I able to realise that I was really, really lucky that I'm, I'm a professional cricketer. There was a lot of luck involved getting my foot in the door. Once it got in there, it was there was a bit more luck and a lot of work that went into it to, to keep me here. And year in, year out, you know, every time we re-sign or extend a contract or something, it's, it's, it's just um, progressing that goal, which is just being a professional cricketer. Um, 
playing for Australia is, is, a, is a cherry on top and it's great. Um, but this is this is what I want to do. I want to I want to be a professional cricketer and and um, and I am doing that. So um, you know, no one's ever knocked back playing for Australia, and no one I don't think everyone ever will. Um, but you know, it's not it's certainly not a focus of mine. Mine was mine was first get my foot in the door and now to stay here. And um, and I guess now that I'm I'm giving back a little bit more than than just just sort of hanging on by the skin of my teeth. Um, it's about performing for the boys in the in the chain room, for my teammates, and and um, and doing as well as I possibly can before the before it, you know the the boss comes knocking at 33 or 34 and says your time's up. So I think you've probably been a bit harsh on yourself. There. <laughs> There's probably not too much luck involved, I don't think. But yeah. um, what did the move from Yeovil um, up to Sydney? What was that like? And, and was it tough leaving home? And you mentioned belief. Was it? Did you sort of Sydney such a big competitive place? Did you believe I'm good enough for this? Uh, I was ignorant enough. Yeah, I was really ignorant. I, I didn't. I didn't really know what uh, what to expect, and and I was so confident, and and you know, um, some would say arrogant. I'd probably say arrogant as well. But um, confident, arrogant, um, ignorant, all these um, probably traits that aren't great as a person, but were good to. Um, to keep my head above water, even if it might have been an act, it might have been, you know, shattered on the inside. But these were the things that I, I sort of portrayed. Um, I hated Sydney. Uh, I still don't like it that much. I just, I'm a country boy, and, and Sydney was so full on. And um, but I knew that if if I wanted to play professional cricket, that's where I had to be. Um, and I, I knew from a very young age that New South Wales was such a hotly contested spot that maybe I wasn't going to graft a career there, maybe it was going to be somewhere else. Um, but yeah, the, the move up wasn't so bad because I'd been out of home for probably since I was 15 or 16 at boarding school. And um, so where did you go to boarding school and how old were you when you went to Sydney? Uh, I would have been, uh, maybe, oh yeah, 15 or 16, um, just after year 10, I went to uh, Kinross Wallaroy in, in Orange and spent a couple of years there. Um, wasn't much of a student, like I said, um, even though my mum was an English teacher, um, I just... I wasn't very good at it. I didn't want to learn. Um, I don't think I'm that stupid, but I just hated hated the schooling life and structure. I loved boarding school, um, but hated school. And I ended up uh, moving to Sydney uh, probably when I was 19 because I had that year off after after school when I busted Operation, my shoulder. Yeah. yeah um, and yeah, ended up in in Kingsford uh, playing for Union New South Wales, which was pretty much in the mixer, it was two k's out of the city and, and pretty close to Coogee and, and all the beaches so it was always pretty busy and um, pretty close to the uni and, and, the, and the reason I went to the uni was because it was just full of country boys and a lot of them from, from Dubbo and, and surrounding areas so it was, it was a good way to, to get into Sydney and, but still have sort of connections and roots back home. Awesome yeah. and then how did the transition, the next phase I suppose is from going up to play grade cricket yeah. Um, into the New South Wales squad. Were you always part of the junior rep um, squads for New South Wales? No, no. I was. I, was, I played a little bit of country um, under 16s and 17s, um, but I was. Yeah, I was not. Uh, I was not your, your. You know, all the way through juniors and stuff. I was never the, um, the sort of the go-to kid. Um, like I said, a bit of luck was that um, uh, when I started playing well and, and I made I sort of made a, a conscious decision to, to give up a few things like um, stop drinking for a while um, obviously you go to Sydney your eyes light up the bright lights and you and you enjoy um, the social side of things a little bit too much so I made a conscious decision to cut back on that was that someone that you'd spoken to someone about and they said you should that was a, just a completely decision made on your own oh uh, it was a decision made on my own but there was there was like no one ever came up to me and said mate you drink too much it was a it was um, you know, you could you could do this if you sort of you know do this, this, and whatever. It, I reckon there was a night where there was maybe a um, the third grade captain or someone came up to me, and we were blotto. Um, it was a pub crawl night or something, and he goes, um, "I'm going to make a new rule for you. You're not allowed to drink after Thursday night." And I went, "Okay, no worries." And or after Wednesday night or something. So Thursday, Friday, I wasn't allowed to drink, and then I thought, well, I may as well just get rid of all of it. Um, and so that that also helped obviously with um, fitness and a few and injuries and and whatnot um, backing up after big days and and it was pretty hot in Sydney at the time as well so 
I went probably uh, three months where um, I didn't drink. And during that three months, I started to get a little bit fitter. I started bowling well. And luckily, there was a bloke called Pat Molinari, who you might know from Perth. Yeah, Mullis, yeah, um, shout out to Patty. Yeah, he, um, he was playing club cricket at the time and, and played a bit of second 11. And the state selectors were coming to the games to watch him bowl. And they'd come every other weekend or, or whenever they spared the time. And, and it just happened to be that when they were there, I bowled well. Um, and when they weren't, I couldn't bowl a hoop down a hill. But it was just lucky. And then they invited me to a, a net session. Um, I remember having uh, a pretty good net session. And then they said, come back. And I, bowl, I think I bowled to Brad Haddon. I was probably bowling, you know, two metres over the front line, but I was bowling bounces and just going hammer and tong and and um, tried to put the wind up him. And, and he walked out of the net and went to the selectors and said, he's pretty good, you should you should think about playing him in the next one day or something. And there I was. So um, ended up playing a one day in Perth, uh, got a couple of wickets and um, played a shield game maybe two weeks later and got a couple of wickets in that as well and then contract. So, um, you know, it was it was a lovely mix between you know luck when they they turned up when I bowled well, um, luck that I was bowling well when I was bowling to the right people like Hads, and um, a little bit of faith put in me by by him and, and the selectors, and then probably a little bit of luck as well when I got wickets in Perth, um, bowled a full bunger that hit Travis Bird on the toe, and then bowled one that went two foot down leg side and. Luke Ronke tried to hook and it touched his glove, so it wasn't exactly a great wicket, but I got two for 30 or something on debut and I went, perfect, here we go. Well, it, apart from maybe the Ronke dismissal, there doesn't sound like too much luck elsewhere. Giving up drinking, sacrificing yeah. things and performing when the selectors are there doesn't sound like too much luck to me, but what did the next few years look like then? You were sort of in and out of the squad. It was hard to, with such, with Mitchell Stark sort of coming through and these guys... Mm -hmm. It was quite a tough time for you to nail down a spot in that New South Wales squad. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, my my first year, I, I think, was my best year. I got I got really fit. Um, well, really fit in comparison. I was I was quite unfit when I first came into the squad. Um, shredded a lot of puppy fat. Got a lot fitter. Um, was able to bowl faster for longer. Um, you know, fitness and, and strength and, and stuff has, has never been. A, a, one of my um, strengths, I guess. But um, I, I made some good leaps and bounds through that. And um, I think first game of the season, I was bowling fast and um, snapped my side and was out for eight weeks again. So, um, you know, we, we went from this, you know, great, we've had a pre-season, really fit, bowling quick in a, in a club game, snap, out for eight weeks, um, re-evaluate, rehab, go again, um, and ended up playing the last five Shield games, I think, for that year. Um, we played a game in Hobart. Uh, Ricky Ponting played. Uh, he got 200, and I was bowling half trackers and full bungers at him. And and it's funny now, even listening to him commentate at the Big Bash, you know, he'll say something complimentary, and you can't help but think in the back of his head, going, "This bloke can't bowl up <laughs> down yeah. a hill." Cause, he doesn't rate me. Uh, yeah, he doesn't rate me. He didn't rate me back then. Um, so, and then we got the ball reversing and I ended up cleaning up the tail and got Pfeiffer. Um, and so they went, you beauty, this bloke can bowl. Um, and then I think the next year, we had a sort of a big exodus. There was a lot of injuries and stuff that first year and I got a, I got a few games. And then that next year, um, there was a little bit of injury issues throughout the off season at the end. Um, had a couple of surgeries, um, missed most of the first half of that season. The first game of that season was against England in a tour match. Um, got a couple of wickets in that, but um, never really sort of lit the world on fire again. Um, and pretty much ended up um, petering out, I guess. And, and uh, we had Usman Kawaja and Phil Hughes had left the, the year before. They had big gaps to fill. Um, and then they tried to get a few blokes back. And uh, I got a call from Trevor Bayliss who said, mate, we can't offer you a contract, um, which was crushing. But in the same in the same breath, he said, I think you're good enough to play. So if you want to go somewhere else, I would recommend that. Yeah. And, and had he not said that, I probably would have stuck around. I just started dating Shannon. Um, I wanted to hang around in Sydney. I didn't want to didn't want to be that guy who got delisted and ran away. Um, but had he not said that, I probably would have stayed. 
and he gave me sort of his blessing or his advice and I went right. We got on the blower and, and called around and Victoria were, were lucky to have me. Awesome. Now we're getting was, to the... Oh, sorry. I was lucky to, I was lucky to come to Victoria and <laughs> Victoria and not lucky to have well, me. Well, they are yeah. very lucky to have got <laughs> you yeah. now. Um, yeah. We'll get into the injuries a little bit later because that's something a lot of everyone gone goes through, especially fast bowlers. But how was then the transition from New South Wales to Victoria? Um, not just personally, but I suppose growing up and I, I represented the Northern Territory when I was younger. I know there was always a big rivalry in junior cricket between New South Wales and Victoria. Yeah. How was it shifting across the border to doing the, the Vicks change rooms? Um, it was it was difficult because I had all these preconceived ideas of what the Victorians were like. Um, I'd not heard nice things about a few of their senior players. Um, and you know, you don't judge a book by the cover or you don't, um, you want to make your own own mind up and, and I unfortunately fell foul of that and I, I decided that you know these guys were not were not the people I wanted to be a part of and during this whole um, decision should I go Victoria, con uh, Tassie were offering a contract maybe a, a rookie contract or something that was not half as good as what Victoria were offering and I was still considering going to Tasmania and um, and was that because of the preconceived ideas with who the Victorians a little, were? A little bit, but I, I like the idea of living in Hobart. It seemed like a, a sort of a town that I could I could relate to a little bit. Um, I didn't like Melbourne um, for some unknown reason. I've been here for four years and I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. So, um, and I'd got you know we we're actually up um, up in Darwin fishing um, in the middle of nowhere, and we're up on top of a hill at the back of this property and, and we got a couple of bars of service and we decided that we were going to go to the Victoria. Um, so we called the manager and it literally like in the middle of no man's land, um, in, in the middle of the never never and called and, and said, um, yeah, we're going to the, the bush rangers. So uh, we've been up there probably four or five times since then and, and we've, they've actually put a sign up there and renamed it Bush Rangers Hill, which is, oh, which is nice pretty one. nice. Um, so um, yeah, we decided that and I got down to Victoria and these and these preconceived ideas that I had of these guys, um, there were a couple that that you know people had, had spoken about that weren't that um, nice. And believe it or not, out of the f probably three or four people that welcomed me into the group, they were two of the four. Basically, they sent me text messages, said welcome. Um, you know, do you need any help moving down? Do you, is there anything we can do? Sort of thing. And and it took me by surprise. And then I actually got down here and. And just saw the way that they um, they work, and they work on a basis that if you can get the job done, no one really cares. Victoria's always had this this um, I guess a tag that sort of followed them was was you know they they fight they bicker they're like an old married couple that that um, you know on the outside they don't look functional, but when it comes to comes as a crunch they're they're extremely functional and that's and that's what they are and we've actually not had too much bickering and, and issues in the last four years because we've been winning um, if we start losing it might change but um, we've been winning and and um, Victoria this intimidating group of people that I was I was so worried about joining has been fantastic because it, it sort of I sort of fit in really I, I walked in and, and um, there was intimidation there was a bit of um, bit of a worry but you know we ended up um, working really well together which awesome. has been great yeah awesome um, now you've been involved in a number of different environments now what, what do you think makes a good culture oh culture has been talked about at no end for the last couple of weeks hasn't it um, you know, they talk about the Australian cricket culture and, and how we want to play cricket um, we've got you know, signs hung up all over the, the dressing room about you know our values and our um, you know what how we want to play our game. Culture, um, you know, what is it? What what is what is culture? You know, there's a million and one different answers, and, and no one has ever seemed to put the put a finger on the right culture. Um, what works for some doesn't work for others. I mean, New Zealand seem like they have this great culture where. They are very appreciative. Um, they support uh, not only themselves, but when their opponents do well, they're very, very uh, supportive of that. You know, they clap every hundred, and they, they they seem like the nice guys, and and that's a culture that works really well for them because we just got back from New Zealand, and and that's what the people are like over there. They're very nice. Um, 
I think Australians are really nice. Does that culture and that sort of approach to the game work for Australians? Um, it could. Um, if that's the way you want to play it, then, then it might work. Um, I think our, uh, our culture at the moment um, is deemed by who's leading the, leading the group. I mean, we've, we've got um, past players coaching the Australian team and, and um, their ideas of culture have been um, crafted and, and moulded by the cultures they had when they were playing. And, you know, Alfie and, and um, Buff, they played in an era where they were just unbeatable. They were an unbelievable team. Um, and they were they were like the the international bullies of cricket, weren't they? They they just played everyone and they bullied everyone, and it was it was great to watch. Um, does that culture that, that they played under and, and that they um, were moulded by does that work for for the the generation we have now? Well, we're about to find out. But um, I think the cultures that w have worked best for for the teams that I've been in are just. Um, it's been look inward, not outward. Um, look at look at what we need to do to be better, and and um, knock anything on the head that that doesn't um, doesn't go that way. I mean, we all want to move forward. We all want to go in the same direction. If there's ever a stray, or if anything's going the wrong way, knock it on the head and move on. And and that's the way Victoria's worked. You, if someone gets out of line, they get pulled in really quickly. And really, there's there's one one thing that culture should be. Um, should revolve around and that's it. Everyone moves in the same direction and if someone goes the opposite, grab them, pull them in the line and, and make sure we're, we're all moving the right way. And make sure your own backyard's clean before you start pointing fingers at others. Correct, yeah. yeah. Correct, yeah. Um, now, you've played with and against some of the world's best players and had a lot of success doing it. What are some of the traits you've seen across the board with, with um, the world's best players you've, you've been involved with? Yeah, it's, it's such a hard one, especially if there's kids watching this sort of podcast is that um, the best players in the world know their game so well and it frustrates the hell out of me because I still don't know my game that well um, and when someone says you know just do what you do best you go like you sort of have to think what is it that I do best and it's even a matter of perception I mean um, our coach Andrew McDonald might watch from the sideline and say geez Trem does that really well and I've got no idea what he's talking about. Mm. He goes, just do what you do best. Well, I, I like bowling bounces. Can I, can yeah, I just keep doing bowl that? All day, no, yeah. no, you've got to bowl out swingers. At, at, and you go, yeah, all right, no worries. So um, I guess the difference between them and, and the rest of us is that they know exactly what they do well. Um, A.B. de Villiers is, is the epitome of um, consistency. Just everywhere he goes, he's consistent. And it's not because he trains harder, he probably trains much harder and, and trains much smarter than most people, but he's played his game for so long that he knows um, he knows what he needs to do to, to be consistent. Um, keep in mind, there was a time where A.B. de Villiers was out of form and there was times where no one really knew who A.B. de Villiers was. He was still playing Test cricket and he was playing for South Africa. But, um, you know, and it seems like a lifetime ago, but, you know, everyone starts somewhere and everyone is just another cricketer sometime so um, you know Steve Smith knows exactly what he needs to do to, to do what he does um, he's got the most unorthodox sort of playing style in the in the world at the moment why does it work because he knows how to make it work mm. um, Jasper Boomer like frog in a blender yeah. arm, straight arms going everywhere hits a Yorker better than anyone I've ever seen because he knows how to do that mm. and he knows his game and um, and that's and that's solely solely down to them. So that I guess the challenge for for kids and and whoever's might be watching this is that you know find out what your game is, find out what you do really well, and emulate it every time you train and every time you play, and try and emulate exactly what you do well. Um, nail that down and 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 keep keep repeating it, keep doing it. And something that's come across with all the guests I've interviewed and all the sort of interviews I listen to is self-awareness about people as a person as well, not just not just their game, but what they need to do as a person to be consistent, which is really important. Now, as a bowler, um, you obviously got a first-class hundred. You're probably a bowling all-rounder, I should say. How much time do you spend on your batting? Uh, it's uh, well, it's a hard one. Enough to get by. Um, if you if you really want to to be better, um, you do you do put the work in, and there's plenty of blokes around the squad that will offer that help. Um, 
we've got Lockie Stevens, who I, I did a lot of work with, and before him, David Hussey. And they were both really good um, for my batting, uh, basically because I'd go to Lockie, mate, I can't hit a cover drive. Um, I, I need to work on my cover drive. And you go, why? You hit the ball really well everywhere else, just keep doing that. I said, Alistair Cook can't hit a cover drive, so why are you trying strength. to change? Yeah, so, um, and they reinforce those. Um, the issue is that the better you get at batting, the further you go up the, the batting order and, and the more the fast bowlers think you can bat, so they bowl more bounces at you and stuff <laughs> like that. So, um, so I love it when like Dan Christian or someone plays because he usually bats at seven, Harper at eight, and I get to bat at nine. So yeah. I like batting at nine, but I always end up at eight. So, um, But yeah, I guess um, taking a few wickets in last season, it doesn't hold a candle to scoring a hundred in a shield game, so yeah. it was great fun and, and awesome. it was um, yeah it was really cool and um, a highlight of the career. So am I right in saying and this is just off the top of my head? Was it in Alice Springs? It was yeah. That's my Alice Springs. There you go. Uh, Special yeah, place there you for go. you. Yeah, it was I, it was hot. Up. Um, lots Craig of lots, yeah, lots of cramping up and um, had a dodgy tie feed the night before, so I was vomiting in the sheds and um, Duke's ball as well um, and hot, stinking hot. And then Farwad walked out without his bat. Yeah. So everyone remembers that game because Farwad walked out without his bat, not because I scored 100. Which well, I remembered it. Yeah. <laughs> Only good players get 100 at Traeger Park. Exactly. There you go. Um, yeah. Now, just before we wrap up, what what are, what are some things you do to switch off from cricket? How do you get away from the game? Um, recently, uh, I've always well, I've always liked fishing. Uh, I'm sort of like my golf. I really like it. I'm not very good at it. Um, those people who who uh, who live and breathe it? They just know where to go, how to do it, what to what to use as bait, what to use as lures, um, where to. They read the waters really well, um, and something I'm getting better at. Uh, down in down in Melbourne now, there's, there's I don't have a boat. I don't get out on the bay very much, but I go inland and, and do a bit of trout fishing, and and only recently started fly fishing, which um, which is you'd probably find a bit strange. Um, it's really frustrating when you're not getting it right um, but it's like you know really frustrating when you can't hit a cricket ball all that well but you, st you, you persist and, and we've persisted with this with fly fishing and, and um, I guess that, that little bit of uh, meditation looks different for everyone doesn't it I mean some people sit in the park and you know cross their legs and um, other people listen to music and I think for, for me um, the, the repetition of you know, either casting and reeling or, or the fly um, casting um, that repetition and, and, um, and I guess trout don't live in ugly places either so mm. you're out in, out in the wilderness in, in a lovely stream, lovely um, lovely mountains around you and um, nice and cool and you're by yourself that's that's probably a little escape that that, um, that uh, helps me sort of relax a little bit it's really annoying and, and when you run it, when you run into someone else on the river, you think like, "What are you this doing? Is this is my spot." Yeah, yeah but it's been there. It's been there for thousands of years before you were here. So, um, but yeah, that's it. Fishing and, and sort of just getting out out of the city um, and getting away. Like we we just had a holiday to Queenstown, and and we got exactly what we needed out of it because when we went away, by the end of it, we wanted to come home, yeah. and that's where where I find fishing a little bit is that you fish all day. And by the end of it, you just want to come home, and, and that's get back on the cricket field. Exactly, yeah, and that's what you and that's what you're looking for as a, as a break. You you don't look for a break to to get away from the game because you don't like it. Mm. You look for it to, to escape a little bit, so you so you refresh and you want to come back. And and you'll find that is is a pretty good. It's an all day experience and, and a bit of um, meditation, and you're usually by yourself. So that's that's probably the best way. Awesome, and I think that's a, a reaffirmed what other our other guests Hilton Cartwright said. He likes to go out and have a surf. Coulter Nile likes to get down south and go to the beach and it's it's their form of meditation just to, to switch off from the, the mind that's always sort of thinking about cricket. Now, yeah. just finally, last few questions. What What's next for you? You're back in pre-season. You mentioned you're off to Brisbane and what, what's the next few months hold? Yeah, so the um, the ODI squad goes off to England. Um, I'm on standby for that. Uh, so I've got to go to Brisbane on the weekend just to, to help out, do a bit of bowling. Um, get prepared for that. Uh, so I've been bowling a little bit in the nets um, just to make sure I get up there and I can I can help out as much as I can. Um, being on standby is a bit of a pain because you don't know, you just, you don't plan anything. You, you might, you might not. So just go with the flow and, and whatever happens, happens. Um, 
But then, yeah, like I said, looking really looking forward to getting back into pre-season. I've had my time away. I've got my puppy fat. I've got my winter layers that I, that I put on throughout the off-season that, that I've got to get rid of. And, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to, to whatever, um, first of all, Junction Oval has to offer because uh, yeah, yeah. our first, yeah, first pre-season in that. But, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to, to pre-season and, and just said whatever happens, happens. I mean, we'll be here. Um, we only have a plan a couple of weeks ahead because... God knows where you're going to end up. Absolutely, you could end up playing big uh, yeah. the blast in England this year. Yeah, who there knows? You, go. you yeah. might get a call up. Who knows? Now, yeah. what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, keep failing. Was it was it sort of took me by surprise. Um, but those people that, that keep failing, um, they never make the same mistake twice. But they fail and they learn and they and they keep moving on. Those perfectionists that 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 never fail, never learn anything. Um, you know, we, like I said, we fail every day. I, I make a mistake every day, regardless of whether it's on a cricket field or not. Um, and the ability to sort of understand understand that mistake, understand why it happened and what you need to do to, to change it. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid of, of making those mistakes. Mm. They, they happen all the time and they happen in all forms and walks of life. So. Enjoy those, enjoy those mistakes, enjoy those failures, and enjoy, um, I guess, the triumph next time you you beat it. And the challenge of overcoming the failure. Yeah. Now, what's your definition of success? Um, well, success, I guess, it's it can be, uh, I guess, a, a staircase. I mean, um, you know, pick a goal, aim for it, and and get there, and and. Um, you know, when we were, when we were younger, we used to have these these training sessions where we'd go, "This is our goal for today," and you had to hit every ball out of the middle. You could only hit the offside net. You could only hit the onside net. And these were little things that, that we set every session. Um, and when we would do that, I would consider that a success. Um, and those little bits, um, you know, gave me a foundation to to be a professional cricketer. And that was my goal growing up. Um, I believe I succeeded as as being a professional cricketer because that's a measurable success um, but I, th I think success um, if you really if you really want something a little bit off the cuff and a little bit random is that um, success is how you feel about it at the end of the day um, 50 wickets last year would would suggest that I had a successful year um, the way I went about getting those wickets I believe wasn't a successful season so I I'd take wickets um, when Scotty Boland would, would land them on a dime for for eight overs and then I'd bowl a half track and they'd, they'd cut it to point or something so I believe the process um, of getting those wickets wasn't successful the numbers at the end was so um, a measurement of success is is how you feel about it and and basically whether you can sleep at night knowing that you've, you've done what you set out to do. Awesome. The process of success. That's what we got this podcast called. Now, yeah. finally, why do you play cricket? I play cricket because I've always loved it. Um, the day I stopped loving it is the day I stopped playing it. Um, but, you know, there's really not much more to it than that. Um, cricket, uh, it changed when it became a job. Played it because it was fun. It cost me money when I was when I was playing it for fun. You'd buy your own gear. You you paid your subs. You started. You became a professional, and the pressure changed. Um, the pressure from different avenues changed. Uh, the pressure, internal pressure, changed, but the game stayed the same. Um, and I play cricket because I love I love the game, but I also love how. Um, how much it's evolving and how much it changes year to year and how much it can change a person. Um, and it, I believe it's changed me exponentially since I was a kid to, to what I am now. Um, and, and I just, you know, I can't imagine what would have happened in my life had I not played cricket, met the people I've, I've, um, I've met through cricket and learnt the lessons I have through cricket. So, um, you know, I play it because I love it, but I play it, you know, and because it's, it is shaped, it has shaped my life basically. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Trem, thank you so no, much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Absolute gold. Cheers, guys. Thank you.